Um, we are going to talk about some OB emergencies uh, to start it off with. We'll have a couple reminders that we'll get to at the end. All right, so things we're going to talk about today, um, some of the emergencies of pregnancy, things that are happening while a female is pregnant, things like miscarriages, ectopics, um, and so on and so forth. And then we will talk about um, when we think a delivery is going to be imminent. So when we think somebody's going to deliver in the field, um, that normal process of how uh, a baby's going to deliver, and then some of the complications of childbirth. All right, so pregnancy can be divided, you know, normally it's divided into three 13 week trimesters. But for us, it's probably a little bit easier to divide it into two halves. So the first half would be early pregnancy, so the first 20 weeks, and then the second half would be late pregnancy or those second 20 weeks. And each half really has its own unique emergencies that we'll talk about. So whenever we um, get a call for a patient who's pregnant or a female um, of childbearing age who has abdominal pain, things we want to know. Um, if they're pregnant or they know they're pregnant, um, when is their due date? Or if they don't know their due date, when's their last menstrual period? Have they ever been pregnant before? Um, and if they were pregnant before, did they deliver? Did they have a C-section? Did they have a vaginal delivery? Do they have a history of trauma? Um, are they having contractions? Do they feel like their membranes ruptured? They got a rush of fluid. Um, have they had any bleeding? And then if they have been pregnant before, did they have any complications like preeclampsia, clampsia, diabetes, or preterm pre labor? All right, so the first one we'll talk about is miscarriage. So it's the most common complication of early pregnancy. Um, it's present about 15, it happens in about 15 to 20 percent of clinically evident pregnancies. So those are females who know that they're pregnant. And then 80% of those occur before the 12th week of pregnancy, so during that first trimester. Um, signs of a potential miscarriage will be the female has morning sickness and then it just goes away. Um, they might have back pain, they might have spotting or vaginal bleeding, or they may pass tissue, which could be that um, the fetus. All right, so what are we gonna do for miscarriages? So if they're stable, Really just try to support the patient, the family, um, transport, you know, if they want to um, or they need to see their OB. Um, if they have signs of shock at all, we think it's probably hemorrhagic, so they're bleeding. So we would get IV access and resuscitate these patients, whether that be with fluids, blood, um, or whatever you have. And if they pass tissue and they end up getting transported, take it with the patient. Because a lot of times these, um, the tissue will go to pathology so that they can try and figure out what happened. There's a couple different types of abortions that you can see on the slide. A threatened abortion would be where a female has like abdominal pain and bleeding, but the baby looks okay. An inevitable abortion is an abortion that's kind of in process, it's gonna happen, the cervix is dilated, uh, versus an incomplete abortion that the baby has already died, but um, the patient hasn't fully passed all the tissue versus a missed abortion means that cervix is closed, but the baby is unfortunately dead. All right, so we'll move on to ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic is when um, a fertilized ovum or a fertilized egg gets implanted or it goes into a area, area of the body that's not the uterine cavity. This occurs in about 2% of pregnancies and it's the leading cause of first trimester pregnancy related deaths. Those deaths are commonly due to hemorrhage, infection, and then if these patients end up going to the operating room to have surgery, um, they can have anesthesia complications. Um, so the, these are all the different places where ectopic pregnancies can implant. Um, they most commonly implant in the tube, um, in the fallopian tube, which we can see here. Um, they can implant um, in the ovaries, a little bit less common. They can implant in the cervix, and then they can implant in the uterine wall, which is a little bit different. And then some pregnancies can actually implant in the abdomen. So it comes out of the fallopian tube and just goes into the abdomen. Um, so things that we'll look for for a ruptured, ruptured ectopic, it's a patient who's probably had a home positive home pregnancy test or positive pregnancy test at a hospital or at urgent care and they have sudden severe abdominal or pelvic pain. They may feel, feel dizzy or feel like they're gonna faint. And we worry with that is, you know, are, is their blood pressure low? Are they not perfusing? They might have pain in the lower back um, or they can have pain in the shoulders. And the pain in the shoulders is usually from 
blood that's in the abdominal cavity that's causing irritation. All right, so here's some pictures of an ectopic pregnancy. So the bottom picture you can see, so this is the uterus here, and then you have the fallopian tubes coming out. Oh, whoops. All right, the fallopian tubes here. This is the white piece is probably the ovary. On the other side, you have the other fallopian tube, and then you have this mass here, which is an ectopic pregnancy. So this is a picture from the operating room. The top picture is a picture from a FAST exam. So if you have a patient who had a positive home pregnancy test, who, has now, who now has abdominal pain and is hypotensive, you do a FAST in this field. If you have capabilities of ultrasound, um, if you look in the right upper quadrant, this structure here is the liver, um, and this is the kidney. Then you see this black stripe of fluid here, and that's blood. Um, so, that, you know, you see that trauma, but you can also see it ectopic. So how do we manage these patients? Have a really high index of suspicion for these patients. Some of these patients don't know that they're pregnant yet, um, but they present, we you know, with uh, abdominal pain, pelvic pain, and they're hypotensive. And if they're unstable, when we need to resuscitate them, get IV access, um, and give them whatever you got. All right, so placental abruption is premature separation of the placenta from the uterine wall. Occurs in about 1% of pregnancies and it uh, accounts for about 30% of bleeding during late pregnancy. And it's associated with pretty significant perinatal mortality and morbidity. Um, there's two different types that we can find. Um, so if the placenta um, is totally um, not totally separated from one side or both sides of the uterus, you can get bleeding that um, goes down through the cervix and through the vagina and you get external signs of bleeding. Or the patient might just have abdominal pain and they have no bleeding because that uterus or the placenta is still adhered on both sides. So you just get bleeding between the placenta and the uterine wall. All right, so when should we think about placental abruption? We need to think about in patients who are pregnant, who come in with abdominal pain and or vaginal bleeding. We really need to think about it in any patient who, pregnant patient who's had a history of trauma. Placental abruption occurs in about 6% of all trauma cases and about 20 to 25% of major trauma. So that could be a fall from standing, a fall down stairs, um, a car accident, really any kind of trauma. And it can manifest up to five days after the initial trauma. So the patient might, you know, have a fall and feel totally fine. Four days later, you get a call um, for a pregnant lady with abdominal pain. This is something to consider. And we think about it with patients who present preterm labor. All right, so um, if you do an exam on a patient who you suspect might have a placental abruption, you might feel a tender uterus. Um, it might be hypotonic, so it just doesn't have quite as much tone um, as normal. And then these patients might be experiencing contractions, so pretty um, high frequency, so many, many contractions, but they're low amplitude. And if you see this image here, this is another ultrasound image. So this whole thing is the uterus. This is probably baby's head here, because um, this is the falx in the brain. And then here's the placenta, this white piece is the placenta. And then you can see this, the wall over here of the uterus, and you can see this black piece, which is fluid in between the uterus and the placenta. All right, so what do we do? Very similar to everything else, get access, if they're in shock, resuscitate them, and then transport. All right, placenta previa is when the placenta overlies the internal os of the cervix. Um, it's a common cause of bleeding during late pregnancy, so those final 20 weeks of pregnancy, and it complicates about half a percent of pregnancies. Um, so you can see in this image over here, normally the placenta is kind of high up and planted in the uterus, but it can be kind of low lying or cover the cervix. So this is mom's heads up here, um, like pelvis, vagina is down here, and there's the cervix. All right. So the classic presentation of placenta previa is when um, a patient who's pregnant presents with painless bleeding in late pregnancy. For these patients, um, they should never get a digital vaginal exam to like check for uh, dilation. So in the hospital, they should never get this because it can provoke really catastrophic hemorrhage. So if you can see, you know, this is mom's pelvis down here. So if you see 
the placenta is kind of overlying that cervix. If you did a digital exam to see if the mom's dilated or not, you could hit a blood vessel in that placenta and the mom could bleed out from it. So like everything else, we'll get IV access and then resuscitate them. All right, so now we'll talk about. So there's really two, three different types. So there's gestational hypertension, um, which occurs during pregnancy and resolves postpartum. Uh, there's preeclampsia, which we think of gestational hypertension with proteinuria or protein in the urine. And then eclampsia, which is when a mom has seizures um, during pregnancy with the signs of preeclampsia. So preeclampsia, the way it's defined is blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, technically two times at least four hours apart, um, and proteinuria, so protein in the urine, after 20 weeks. It occurs in about 12% of pregnancies and is responsible for about 20% of maternal deaths. So things that we can look out for for these patients, you know, if their blood pressure is elevated, maybe they have lower extremity edema or swelling, maybe they're having trouble with their sight, they might have a headache, they might have abdominal pain. Um, and then there's another classification of preeclampsia called severe preeclampsia, and that's when their blood pressure is greater than 160 over 110, um, either or. Um, and we can see like acute uh, renal failure or patient's kidneys failing. We can see cerebral or visual disturbances and pulmonary edema. So big thing for these patients is really trying to supportive support them as you transport them to the hospital, and we can give them magnesium to decrease that risk of progression to eclampsia. Which eclampsia is whenever a patient who has preeclampsia or newly diagnosed, they may not know that they have preeclampsia yet, they just present with a seizure and it occurs during pregnancy. So the treatment for these patients is a four to six gram dose of magnesium. So this dose goes over 15 to 20 minutes, so you have to be careful with it because magnesium can, can cause patients' blood pressures to go down, which theoretically this patient's gonna have a high blood pressure. Um, so they get this loading dose and then we'll end up giving them a continuous dose, but hopefully they have been transported to the hospital by that point. Um, you can see toxicity from magnesium, um, things to look out for like a loss of uh, deep tendon reflexes, um, which it's going to be hard to check for in the back of a truck um, or a helicopter. Um, you can see respiratory depression, so you got to be careful that you're monitoring these patients to make sure that they're ventilating okay. Um, they can have muscular paralysis, and then, you know, when their magnesium levels get too high, they can suffer from a cardiac arrest or a respiratory arrest. All right, so big thanks for all the kind of emergencies that happen during pregnancy as really just to maintain a high index of suspicion when a female presents with abdominal pain or any other kind of pelvic complaint. All right, so now we're gonna move on and talk about um, out-of-hospital out of deliveries. So out-of-hospital deliveries are really rare. They only count for about 2% of all births in the US. And the majority of them are really uncomplicated, a vertex presentation. So that means baby's head is down and they only need supportive care. But there are some exceptions, and these exceptions can really be catastrophic. So we need to make sure that we're prepared for them. Because let me know if you can hear me. It'll take 40 seconds. Okay. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. We are back. Um, I'm sorry you're not going to be able to see me anymore, but um, you'll be able to see the board, which is good. Okay. All right. So we're talking about out of hospital deliveries now um, and how the majority of the times the baby delivers themselves and they're totally fine. But there are a lot of there are a couple of instances where that's not going to be the case. So we need to be prepared for those. So we'll start talking about this with a case. So you have a 24 year old female who's complaining of abdominal pain. So you get the call out for this. Um, you get there. She's laying in the floor in a puddle of fluid. And she says, my baby's coming. I feel like I need to push. And this is what you look like. All right. So an imminent pre-hospital delivery is a delivery that's going to happen very soon, likely prior to getting to the hospital. And it can be due to several things. It can be due to abnormally low resistance of the birth canal so that baby can just go through too fast. Abnormally strong uterine contractions, so they're pushing the baby out too quickly. 
a lack of awareness of painful contractions. So maybe mom didn't even know she was contracting, so she didn't go to the hospital or a combination of all the above. And there's a couple of risk factors to things we think about, like placental abruption, um, which can lead to preterm labor, um, multiparity, and then small infant size. So if you get on scene, um, like in this case, and you think that the mom's about to deliver, she's pregnant and about to deliver, um, just try to get a rapid history from the parent, from the mom. You know, has she ever had a vaginal delivery before? Has she ever had a precipitous delivery before? Because these women can have more rapid labors. Then we want to try to figure out quickly whether or not we know the gestational age of the baby. So the mom, if she knows she's pregnant, she might know her estimated due date. If not, you can use a calculator online to figure out the last menstrual period, which is probably not going to be very helpful in this situation, or you can palpate the top of the urine fundus. So if you can see in this image um, on the right side of the screen, if the uterine fundus, if you can feel it at about the belly button, the mom, the baby's age is about 20 to 22 weeks. And so we think that if um, you can palpate the uterine fundus above the belly button, that that baby is probably viable of a viable age for delivery. Then try to get a quick medical history um, and then ask their medications. All right, so you're going to do a physical exam on these people. So if you think that they're going to deliver, we need to know, uh, is the baby head down? Can you see the head? Um, and if you can, then you're probably going to end up delivering where you are. Um, or if you see like a umbilical cord protruding, which we'll talk about at the end. So some examples. So if you get on scene and the mom is pushing with her contraction, she's probably going to deliver where she is because her cervix is probably fully dilated. You're not going to make it to the hospital. If you can see the fetus, if the mom is, if the baby's crowning, so the head is coming out, then she's going to deliver. And if you can't see the fetus, but mom says, you know, I really feel like the baby's coming. I feel like I need to bear down and push. It's probably going to deliver where you are. So this is an image of what crowning is. So the pelvis is kind of to the right side of the screen. Um, you can see baby's head is kind of coming through the vaginal opening. So if you can see a head of hair, that baby's going to come soon. All right. So once you decide, you know, you have a pregnant patient and you... Um, decide that delivery is imminent so you can see baby crowning. Um, really call for help. That's going to be the most important thing that you can do. If you're on scene by yourself, you have one other person with you, you're probably going to need backup because you're going to have two patients. You're going to have mom and baby, and you want to make sure that both are okay. And then if you have time, you know, get your OB kit, give mom some supplemental oxygen, and then try to get IV access if you have, if you have time. All right, so back to our case. So you got on scene, there's a pregnant lady who said that she is about to deliver. So you are concerned for an imminent delivery. So she says, oh, I've had two previous vaginal deliveries, um, which means she's probably going to deliver a little bit quicker. No medical problem. She takes a prenatal, um, but she didn't really have a lot of prenatal care. Um, and you, so you do a quick exam and you can see the baby's head. So you see this picture on the right. So you see the baby's head coming. So then you start getting ready for delivery. You get your OB kit. You call for help, you get access, you give her oxygen. And so um, when we're preparing for delivery, if you can, try to get the mom in this position. So this is the lithotomy position. So mom is kind of in a semi-seated position with her hips flexed and abducted, so hips are out, and then the knees flexed. If mom can't do this, like a knees to a chest position is also okay. All right, so the first thing you're going to do in like a normal vaginal delivery where baby is head down, um, we're going to deliver the head first. So you're going to apply constant light pressure to the head, really just to control the delivery. You don't want the baby's head to come out too fast because then that's when um, these mothers get like vaginal lacerations and they start bleeding from them afterward. So don't pull on the head, just let mom gradually push it out. Um, and most commonly the baby's face is going to be down, like towards the mom's back. All right, so once you deliver the head, normally the baby's going to rotate to one side or the other. You just kind of let it happen. Um, and then once the baby's rotated, we're going to try to deliver the anterior shoulder, which is the shoulder um, closest to the mom's uh, uh, pubic bone. And so what you're going to do is kind of gently guide the baby's head downward so we can pop that anterior shoulder out. And I have some pictures of this. 
and then we'll slightly, and then once you deliver the anterior shoulder, we're going to try to deliver the posterior shoulder by gently guiding that head down, uh, upward. So you see that from this picture. So you deliver the head, the baby rotated, turned to the side. You kind of gently guide downward to deliver that anterior shoulder and then upward to deliver that posterior shoulder. All right, so once you get the shoulders delivered, normally the torso and the legs come immediately afterward. So the biggest thing is just holding on to the baby. Um, once baby's out, um, if mom looks stable, baby looks stable, um, you can give baby to mom, cut that umbilical cord about a minute after delivery, really just to kind of help baby transition from kind of interuterine care to, you know, real life. And you can expect to see about 500 cc's of blood to be lost. All right, so this is just a recap of all that. So if you start in four um, at the bottom on the left, um, baby is about to start crowning. So baby's crowning in five, baby's head rotates in six. You deliver that anterior shoulder by gently guiding downward in seven and then gently guiding upward to deliver that posterior shoulder. The placenta is going to deliver spontaneous, spontaneously, usually about 10 to 30 minutes after the fetus is delivered. If mom and baby look stable, um, I would say you could probably stay on scene to let this happen because it's going to be a little bit less messy than in the back of a, a rescue truck. Um, if mom and baby do not are not stable, if one looks very sick, obviously you just go on a transport. Um, if you are delivering the placenta, what you can do to help is just kind of gently massage the uterus like on top of mama's abdomen um, just to assist it to come out. You'll have the cord when you cut baby's umbilical cord. Um, theoretically, you would clamp it on two sides and cut in the middle so that you don't have a lot of blood loss. Um, but you can use those. Um, uh, the clamp to kind of gently pull on the umbilical cord to pull the placenta out, but just don't pull too hard because you can actually separate it from the umbilical cord and then you might not have anything to hold on to, or you can actually cause the uterus to invert. So just kind of a, a gradual light traction. All right, so back to the case. So you have this 24 year old, 24 year old who's pregnant, who we've decided is about to deliver. So you get your OB kit, you call for help, you put mom in the right position, you slowly deliver the head, but then when you try to deliver that into your shoulder, the baby's head kind of goes back in. You're like, oh my gosh, what do I do now? All right, so now we're moving on to some of the complications of childbirth. So due to the kind of low frequency, but high risk nature, these outcomes or complications can occur. And some of them we can resolve in the field, but a lot of them we can't. So we need to know what we can do, when we can do it, and when we just need to transport. Um, the biggest thing that we can do um, now is to focus on training and knowing, you know, when you're going to need some more experts. All right, so the first one is a breach presentation. So this, so normally baby's head is down. Um, a breach is when the baby's head is up usually. So baby's bottom or baby's feet or both um, are, uh, would be coming out first. So they're closer to the pelvis. It occurs in about three to four percent of all deliveries and about two and a half in the pre-hospital setting. Um, most of the time, what the complications arise because the baby's breached, and that can be because the um, the bottom or the feet just aren't enough surface area to completely dilate the cervix. Um, when you're delivering, that baby's head can get entrapped, um, or the umbilical cord because it's a smaller area with the feet and the buttocks. You can have that umbilical cord protrude um, through the uh, cervix and vaginal opening before the baby, and we'll talk about that. Um, or we can try to pull the baby out too hard and complicate it that way. So once we see that a baby's breech, if we see their feet, um, really a C-section is going to be the preferred route of delivery. So the best thing we can do is try to cover the presenting part, whether that be a foot or a buttock, in a sterile or kind of warmed wet towel, support it, but don't elevate it and don't apply traction. The best thing is going to be transport if you have time. If the mom is already, you know, delivering, she can't stop pushing, her tra contractions are too strong. The best thing you can do is put her in that lymphotomy position. So hips flex and out and the knees flex or a knee to chest position. And try to just let mom push the baby out. So try to avoid 
um, assisting until mom gets the buttocks and the feet out. Once those deliver, what you can do or have your partner do is apply a gentle super pubic pressure. And what's that, what that's gonna do is try to push that head down so that it comes out. Then you'll deliver the shoulders one at a time and deliver the head. This seems a lot easier than it probably actually is. All right, um, so now we'll talk about umbilical cord prolapse. So this is when that umbilical cord goes through the cervix prior to the presenting fetal part. So you do your pelvic exam like right before um, you think the uh, delivery is imminent. So you do a quick exam and you see a cord. This is bad. So why this is bad is because the baby's head or foot or buttock, whatever, will push on onto that cord as it's trying to come out and it'll compress that cord. And the umbilical cord is what supplies the baby with all the oxygen and blood and nutrients that baby needs. And if it's compressing, then it's not getting those things. This occurs in about 1% of all deliveries and pre-hospital. Risk factors for an umbilical cord prolapse would be like a breach presentation, a lack of prenatal care, mom just didn't know, um, twinning. So a lot of times first baby will be um, vertex, so head down. So you deliver the first baby and then the umbilical cord starts to come out. Um, or if the baby's just big, so macrosomia means the baby's big. It's associated with pretty um, increased perinatal, perinatal mortality. So it's really important for us to check for this when we're looking at the perineum. So this is one of the biggest things that you're doing when you're doing your quick external exam is seeing if you see a cord or if you see a head. So what happens if you see this? So if you see a cord, the best thing you can do is put mom in like a knee to chest position and then put gloves on and gently elevate the presenting part. So if that's the head, gently elevate the baby's head off of the umbilical cord and then transport. Because you're trying to prevent the baby from compressing the umbilical cord so that it's getting oxygen. But the um, best thing for this mom is gonna be to have a C-section. All right, and now shoulder dystocia. So this is failure of the fetal shoulders to deliver after the head. So you deliver the head and then that anterior or posterior shoulder just will not come. It occurs in less than 1% of all deliveries, but it can be really scary. Um, and it's most commonly because the shoulders are just impacted against the pubic bone or the um, sacrum. Uh, most commonly, the anterior shoulder is the one that's going to be affected. Usually, this usually happens because the baby's just really big and just doesn't fit through the canal as well, um, but it can also be due to the fetal head just delivering too fast and the baby not being able to completely rotate. Um, there's really no reliable prediction criteria, so this can happen to anybody, um, but those are two reasons that it can happen more often. So what are you going to look for to think that somebody has a shoulder dystocia? So it's heralded by the turtle sign. And what that means is you deliver that head, the head's coming out, you're trying to deliver that shoulder, and then all of a sudden the head goes back in, back into the vagina and into the cervix. Um, that's the turtle sign. It's associated with pretty significant fetal morbidity and mortality. That can be because, you know, we're pulling too hard trying to get that shoulder out. We cause a brachial plexus injury or the baby can suffocate. But if we can relieve this in a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes, usually the risk of permanent injury or death is very low. All right, so what can we do to fix this? So the first thing we'll do is put is try the McRoberts maneuver. And this uh, usually fixes it the majority of the time. So how you do this is you put, you hyperflex the mom's hip. So you put knees to chest, um, which kind of increases that distance between the sacral bone and the pubic bone. And then you have someone, your partner, apply super pubic pressure. So apply pressure right above that pubic bone. And you put mom's hips in the knees to chest position, but you're probably going to need someone to hold them because she's, it's not going to feel well. Um, if that doesn't work, which it normally does, but if that doesn't work, you can put the patient on all fours, which is called the gasket maneuver. And if that's unsuccessful, we really need to focus on trying to get that patient to the hospital because they might need a C-section. Oh boy. Oh man. One second, y'all.
All right. Sorry, guys, we're back. All right, so now postpartum hemorrhage. So it's the leading cause of maternal death worldwide. Um, and it's an estimated blood loss of over 500 cc's following a vaginal delivery. Obviously, that's hard to estimate during pregnancy or during a delivery because you just see a lot of blood. Um, but if mom keeps bleeding, then we worry about this. If she gets hypotensive, we worry about this. It can be classified into two different categories, so primary and secondary hemorrhage. Primary is the one that you're going to see, and it occurs in that first 24 hours after delivery. It happens about 4 to 6 percent of all pregnancies, and it's usually due to uterine acne, which I'll show you in the next slide. But it can be due to other things like a retained placenta, um, uterine inversion, placenta accreta is when the placenta kind of grows into the uh, uterine wall, um, or some sort of trauma, so like a vaginal laceration. The secondary uh, postpartum hemorrhage is going to occur after the 24 hours after delivery, and that's usually because there's still retained products there, whether that be placenta or something else, or a coagulopathy. So in this image, you can see on the left, the uterus is contracted. So, you know, you have baby in there, that uterus gets really small and contracts, and those blood vessels that are in the uterus contract down and um, vasoconstrict. When you have uterine acne, which is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage, that uterus does not contract down. And so it's still causing a lot of bleeding. And the best thing that we can do for this is to do a fundal massage. So you um, massage that fundus on the mom's abdominal wall in a circular motion. We can, um, you know, if she continues to bleed, make sure you've got good access. Um, fluid resuscitate, if you have blood, give that. Um, there's other medications we can use if you're close to a hospital, like oxytocin. We can also use TXA. Um, and then if you can see the, where the mom is bleeding from, like if it's a vaginal laceration, we can apply direct pressure or do vaginal packing. All right, so back to the case. So you have this 24-year-old pregnant lady, you delivered the head, you're trying to deliver that anterior shoulder, but that anterior shoulder just kind of retracted back into the perineum. So that's the turtle sign. So you apply the McRoberts maneuver, which if y'all remember, it's where you put the mom's knees to the chest and apply suprapubic pressure, and then you deliver the anterior shoulder and the posterior and the rest of the baby's body. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Okay, so in conclusion, in conclusion, so if we're assessing a pregnant patient, we're concerned that they're in labor, that they're going to deliver imminently, the best thing we can do is perform a quick external exam just to see if you can see head, see if you see cord, and then call for help and uh, get your OB kit. Um, you're going to deliver the head, then the shoulders, and then the rest of the body. And the big thing is recognizing when these complications occur and knowing what you can treat and what you can't in the field. All right, and this is my dog Lila saying I'm sorry for all the technical difficulties. You don't mind mentioning to him about the intubation of protocols. Oh yes, okay, a couple quick updates and we'll take a short break before Dr. During talks. Um, the new protocols go live April 29th. So if you have not seen those, look on the website. Um, Everything is going to be category A, so make sure that you know what you're doing. Um, obviously, you can call if you need to. And then if you are intubating a patient or replacing a supraglottic airway, make sure that these patients have waveform capnography. Um, if you're taking, if you have an airway at all, they need waveform capnography to confirm that too. And if you're not getting it, then take that tube out and try again, because otherwise we're going to hurt the patient. Cool. All right, we're going to take a quick break. Very good. All right, guys, so today we're going to talk about, we're going to segue from uh, delivery to care of the baby. Seemed like a uh, natural progression of events. Uh, so which babies require resuscitation? This is called the inverted pyramid of neonatal resuscitation. And there's some things that pretty much every baby needs, like they all need warmed, they all need suctioned all the way down to babies who need epinephrine and chest compressions, which are very, very few. Um, and so this is called the inverted pyramid because at the top are the folks that everything, every baby needs, all the way down to the very, very few number of neonates who actually do require extensive resuscitation, which is really fewer than 1%. 
um, and approximately 10% require some sort of intervention at birth. Um, but it, that's, again, a very small number. Almost 90% or more make the transition uh, into the world with very little assistance from us. Again, maybe some warming, some suctioning, and that's about it. Um, there are some risk factors that you can identify if you have arrived to somebody in labor. Um, there are some risk factors that uh, predispose babies to needing resuscitation. The first and the most obvious is gestational age. If you're <coughs> preterm or uh, early than low gestational age, you're going to probably need more extensive resuscitation. Um, if the mother received any prenatal care, lack of prenatal care generally predisposes babies to needing resuscitation. And then obviously if there's any complications or illnesses during to the during the pregnancy, um, that could predispose you to uh, needing resuscitation as well. So one of the things we have to kind of understand in order to understand neonatal resuscitation is neonatal is fetal circulation anatomy. Um, because neonatal resuscitation is very different than what we're used to dealing with PALS and ACLS. And the reason is because of the underlying fetal circulation. What neonatal resuscitation does is it aims to correct what didn't go right when you were born. So there's a lot of stuff that takes place when you're born. Uh, when you take that first big deep breath, um, because in, when you're inside mom, blood doesn't really go to your lungs. So when blood comes back to your heart through the vena cava, there is a hole between the atrium called the foramen ovale. And most of the blood shunts across that into the right side of the heart and then goes out into the systemic circulation. The small amount of blood that does go to the um, lungs uh, through the pulmonary artery, then passes through a little vessel called the ductus arteriosus, which connects the, connects the pulmonary artery to the aorta. And so then that blood actually shunts into the aorta and out into the circulation as well. And that's because your lungs are filled with fluid and your pulmonary pressure is actually higher than your systemic pressure because your blood is all oxygenated by mom. OK, so when you're born and you cry and take the first big deep breath, that fluid starts to reabsorb, your alveoli expand, your pulmonary pressure drops, your systemic pressure raises. And that's what causes the foramen ovale to seal and blood starts then shunting to the lungs so that you oxygenate your own blood and start circulating to your pro to then to your systemic circulation. So when things go wrong in the neonatal period, when you're first born is typically because one of the things in that chain of events, when you take that first breath, something in that chain of events didn't go right. And so unlike ACLS or PALS that aims at correcting primary arrhythmias um, or correcting things like, you know, heart attacks and other things that cause you to arrest, neonatal resuscitation really just has the goal of fixing what went wrong in that chain of events and aims at kind of re trying to recreate that chain of events. And that's why it's pretty significantly different. So this is neonatal resuscitation protocol. This is the algorithm for neonatal resuscitation. And we're gonna kind of walk through these a little bit step by step. Um, but what you'll notice is at the very, 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 very bottom, um, the very last box there is when we start to give IV epinephrine. So there's a lot of things that happen before that, which is really counterintuitive to what we have really had driven into our heads when it comes to arrest situations or resuscitation situations. And again, that's because our goal here is to try and reestablish the chain of events that didn't happen <clears throat> when the baby transitioned to extra uterine life and to resuscitate the baby. So the first steps are pretty easy. If the baby comes out, they're term, they have good tone, they're breathing, they're crying. This is pretty easy, right? This is a normal delivery. There's not a lot for us to do. We suction the baby's mouth and nose, we dry it off, we wrap it up to keep it warm, and we hand it to mom, right? Um, this, this is what we all hope for. Um, Keeping the baby warm, one of the best things you can do is actually give it, just give it to mom, put it on mom's chest, put a blanket over it. Um, this is one of the cool things about the human species and how they've evolved is that you can actually take a mom with twins and put one twin on either side of mom's chest and mom's skin temperature on either side will vary up to about 10 degrees in order to accommodate the baby and keep the baby at the right temperature. So the best heater for baby is actually mom. 
Um, so put the baby on mom's chest, wrap, put a blanket over it, put a hat on the baby because um, babies lose a lot of heat through their head. Um, and that should be more than enough to keep baby warm after you've suctioned it, dried it, you're cut the cord, you're good to go. All right. Um, now, if baby comes out and they're not term or they don't have good tone or they don't start crying and breathing right away, the next step is really <coughs> just to warm the baby position the air and reposition the airway, suction it out and stimulate it. A lot of times, sometimes these babies just flicking their foot, something to stimulate them will kind of get them to take that first big breath. And once they take that first big breath, that whole chain of events starts, okay? So if baby comes out and doesn't look great, we're gonna warm them, position, reposition the airway, clear the secretions, dry them and stimulate them. We do that for 15 seconds. Everything in NRP is either 15 or 30 seconds. Everything's in blocks of 15 or 30 seconds. So we do that for 15 seconds. If that doesn't work and the baby's apneic or gasping or has a low heart rate, uh, then we move on to positive pressure ventilation. All right, notice it doesn't say, you know, hook up the monitor, look for a defibrillate, for a, a rhythm that you can defibrillate. It doesn't say start access. Again, this is very different than what we're used to doing with things like ACLS because we're, our target is different. Our target here is to recreate that chain of events that didn't take place when the baby was born. So if the baby's apneic, gasping, or has a low heart rate, we're really just gonna bag them, attach a monitor, and it even says consider cardiac monitor. So pulse ox and positive pressure ventilation are really the first steps in a resuscitation of a baby. We're going to bag the baby for 30 seconds. And we're going to try and keep the baby warm. So one of the things we can do uh, is reducing hypothermia in preterm infants with polyethylene wrap. So when we teach like neonatal resuscitation in low resource countries, polyethylene is you can buy these fancy things called neo wraps that are sterile polyethylene wraps that are quite expensive. Or you can take a Ziploc baggie and place the baby in a Ziploc baggie because polyethylene is what Ziploc baggies are made out of. And what that does is it prevents evaporative heat loss from the baby and it helps keep the baby warm as you actively warm it as well. The other thing is if we, when we put the pulse ox on, we need to make sure that the pulse ox goes on the baby's right hand. So remember we talked about when you're inside mom and you're circulating your blood, blood doesn't really go through your lungs. What does go through the lung to the lungs goes through the ductus arteriosus into the uh, aorta to go to the systemic circulation. What we want to do when we're looking at babies, the established standard of pul for pulse ox is a preductal sat. Um, and the only way to guarantee a preductal sat because that ductus arteriosus can attach to the aorta in sort of various places. Um, is to get the baby's right hand. Uh, so pulse ox in a neonatal resuscitation always goes on the right hand. And then we're gonna bag the baby. Ventilating the baby really is the single most important step. Again, most of this chain of events that occurs in when you're born all get set off by that first big breath, okay? And so that first big, recreating that first breath is generally the biggest step in this. And so most babies, most resuscitations that are what's going to happen is you'll bag the baby, give it a few breaths, and then those lungs will expand, that pulmonary pressure will drop, that systemic circulation starts to go or pressure goes up, baby starts to circulate and will start crying, breathing, and like swatting at the bag. Okay. The number of babies that I that I've resuscitated that have come out, you give them a few breaths and then you're done is probably accounts for 95% of the babies I've had to resuscitate in my career, okay? So again, we want ventilating the baby is the single most important thing here. So positioning the airway in the sniffing position with a head tilt, chin lift, getting that airway open, ensuring we have a good seal, that's the most important thing. This is almost always a two-person job. We generally think of bagging an EMS as a one-person job, right? Because you have one hand on the mask and one on the bag. This is really a two-person job for a baby because you have to have one person making sure you've got a really, really good seal and one person squeezing the bag because that seal is key. And a lot of us don't necessarily have perfectly neonatal sized masks. And so having to hold that the right way to get a good seal is going to be key. So good two-person bagging with a good seal. We're going to ventilate them at a rate of 40 to 60 breaths per minute. I know PALS 
you know, we think of PALS as sort of the rate that we ventilate at has been lowered. It's more like adults now, right? But again, this is a little baby, and so we're going to recreate their respiratory rate um, more than, uh, more appropriately. And then if we're not getting good chest rise, we're going to suction the airway, reposition, and check the seal. So after we bag the baby for 30 seconds, if the heart rate is still below 100 or the baby's still not breathing well, notice the next step is really bag better, right? So we're right here. We bag the baby. Uh, we, so we've bagged the baby. We've come down, we've done that for 30 seconds. We've come down and heart rate is still below 100. If yes, the answer is really just bag better, right? So uh, check for chest movement, correct ventilatory steps, consider an advanced airway at that point, right? But it really isn't required. Really, the answer is bag better um, because we really got to make sure we're getting a good seal, getting good chest rise, and ventilating that baby. Again, attempting to give them that first breath that recreates that chain of events. On the right there, you'll notice the preductal sats after birth. Remember, you're, you're, you live relatively hypoxic when you're inside mom, right? Because you're essentially stealing oxygen away from mom's circulation. And be, to do that, you basically have to have an, a gradient in the oxygen concentration, right? And so when you're born, you're actually normally hypoxic. You're relatively hypoxic because you've lived that way inside mom because that's how you're able to passively diffuse oxygen out of mom's circulation. <coughs> so those are our targeted SATs after birth. Notice 60 to 65% one minute after birth. And then they steadily start to rise until about 10 minutes. And not until about 10 minutes of life do we start to consider a sat, a normal sat for a baby, what we think of as a normal sat in most people, right? So, you know, a sat of 70 and a five minute old is pretty good. You're 70, 75, 80, you're doing really well. Um, and so again, the numbers are sort of relative. And so we got to think about that as part of our resuscitation. If the baby's crying, screaming, and satting 80% at five minutes, that's not somebody I need to keep bagging or doing anything with. They've actually achieved a normal sat for someone their age, right? And we can drive them and hand them off to mom. So after we've bagged better, uh, then we uh, are, we're going to recheck our, we're going to do that for 30 seconds. We're going to think about a advanced airway. Most of the time for us, we don't carry innovation equipment for something designed for a little newborn. Um, if you have UE scopes, the smallest blade, if it's a big term baby, you may be able to use that blade. It's going to be, a, it's going to be tight, but it's possible if it's a big term baby. Um, most of the time for us, this is going to be eye gels. And remember, eye gels, the smallest size goes down to a pretty small baby, like 2.5, 3 kilos. Um, and so a term baby or close to term baby, you may be able to use an eye gel in. OK, a lot of times for us, though, advanced airway isn't necessarily going to be an option in the pre-hospital setting and debating if this is a 28 weeker, a 30 weeker. That's a really, really tough innovation. We probably don't have the right size equipment, so it may just be a small oral airway and good bagging, and that's OK. So once we've done that for 30 seconds, we're going to recheck our heart rate. The heart rate is below 60. That's when we start doing compressions finally, right? So we're going to, if not already have an advanced airway, then do it if that's an option. We're going to start our chest compressions. We're going to coordinate that with positive pressure ventilation, and we're going to and then move down sort of what we think of as a more traditional resuscitation. So NRP teaches this our acronym. It's called Mr. SOPA. So when you get to the bag better step, these are the things they teach to think about to bag better. So one is mask adjustment, making sure you're getting a good seal. Move that mask around, make sure you're getting a good seal. Reposition the airway, suction, excuse me, open the mouth, increase the pressure. So if you have a pop-off valve on your bag and you're not intubated, you may need to close that pop-off valve to get more pressure to expand those lungs. And then alternate airway. Again, we talked about this advanced airway management, intubating neonate, especially a premature one, is technically difficult. We usually don't have the capabilities. Most people don't carry a double zero Miller blade in their bags. 
Um, the eye gel, again, the pink size, which is the smallest, the size one, does go down to a two to five kilo kid. Um, so you may be able to intubate a term or near term baby um, using that or to put in a superglottic airway with that. Um, but usually BLS airways are gonna be our go-to. We talked about starting compressions if that heart rate remained below 100. Um, there's two ways to do that, the two thumb or two finger method. The two thumb method actually tends to give better chest compressions as long as you have your thumbs up. You don't want them just kind of laying across the chest. You want your thumbs angled up so that the force really is on your fingers pressing down on the center of the chest, not just kind of squeezing the chest, if that makes sense. Um, so we're going to compress to a third of the AP diameter, allowing to full recoil, and we're going to coordinate our compressions with our ventilations at a three to one ratio. Again, here, ventilating the patient is really more important. Uh, and because, again, we're trying to recreate a series of events that didn't occur. So unlike 15 to two and things we historically you know, think about uh, with resuscitation, this is going to be a three to one uh, compression to ventilation ratio. And the goal is to have 120 events per minute. So that's basically 90 compressions with 30 breaths every minute. So again, you're gonna be compressing and ventilating pretty fast and in pretty rapid sequence. Um, so it's gonna be really important to coordinate those, count those off uh, and try and get that 120 events per minute. Again, basically recreating sort of normal neonatal vitals and circulation. And we're gonna do that for one minute before we reassess the baby. At this point, we also consider vascular access and epi administration. Um, umbilical venous lines is preferred, but it's not really a great option for us in the field. It's really not a technically difficult procedure. Um, if you look at the umbilical cord, there's two arteries and one vein in there. Um, usually the arteries are side by side, and it usually looks kind of like a smiley face. And you, all you do is take a catheter and feed it down the vein until you basically get blood return. It's actually a technically fairly simple procedure. The problem is it has to be done completely sterilely. You know, we've talked in the past in training with peds that babies don't really develop much of an immune system and they don't really have the ability to fight bacterial infections. And so if this isn't done completely sterilely, you basically fed a um, bacterial infection straight into their central circulation. Um, and that can be pretty devastating. Um, so while it's not technically difficult, the conditions for us to do it well in the pre-hospital setting don't really exist. It's really hard for us to do anything truly sterilely, which is why this procedure isn't in the pre very much in the pre-hospital world, except for like critical care transport teams, some of them that do specialize in neonatal transport. If that's unavailable, we can attempt IV access, but IV access in little premature babies, especially if they're being actively resuscitated and their vascular collapse is gonna be incredibly difficult. Um, you know, small 26 gauge winged infusion sets may, may, big emphasis on may work. Most of us don't carry a lot of those around. Um, and so really, for us, it's going to be IO access. Uh, when we think about IO access in little babies, uh, if it's a fairly close to term baby, that's an option because their bone, bones are fairly hard and firm and have developed. In small, tiny, preemie babies, IO access becomes difficult. Their bones are still very, very soft. They're still a large, mostly cartilage. Um, and so doing that is going to be really hard to do. Um, we can attempt it. If we're going to attempt IO access in little babies, usually we're going to be thinking about the distal femur. Um, humerus isn't an option, and their proximal tibias, honestly, are just too small and soft. You're going to drill through them. It doesn't matter how good you are, how many times you've done this, you're just going to. They're so soft and they're so small that, that the needle is just going to go through that space. So distal femur is going to be your best option. Go one finger width above kind of where their knee is and drill straight down. Um, and the femur is normally big and developed enough that hopefully we can get into that space for access. But it is difficult even in little like in very, <coughs> very premature babies. Once we do that, we're gonna do epinephrine, 0.01 IV or IO, same dosing as you would for any other peds arrest. Um, if vascular access can't be obtained, but we were able to intubate the baby, so say this was a late-term baby and our UE scope size one worked, and we were able to intubate that kid with a 3.5 ET tube, 3.35 ET tube, 
then you can't actually give epi down the ET tube uh, 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. So we're going to up the dosing. Uh, and you actually can give uh, endotracheal epinephrine to babies, to neonates. So you can give it to anyone, but it's sort of fallen out of vogue for everyone else. Other things to consider. So we've done our compressions, we've done our airway, we're bagging, we're compressing, we've given a dose of epi, we've reached, we've done that for a minute, we've rechecked everything, we're still in a arrest situation. Uh, that's when we got to start thinking about, this is sort of the H's and T's uh, for little babies, for neonates. Um, if blood loss is a concern, then volume expansion, maybe mom had some hemorrhaging and therefore baby has uh, some blood loss as well. Um, so normal saline is still the crystalloid of choice in neonates. I know we've switched to LR for a lot of things, LR for sepsis, LR for burns, LR for trauma now, uh, but normal saline is still considered the fluid of choice in neonates. And we're gonna give them 10 milliliters per kilogram. Pneumothorax should be considered. Obviously we've been compressing this baby who has a soft rib cage. It's hard to fracture their ribs, but it can be done. Additionally, they can actually have traumatic pneumothoraces just from the birth trauma. Um, and so if we have, you know, we're getting chest rise only on one side, that trachea looks deviated. We don't have great lung sounds on one side. Uh, we could needle that baby's chest and decompress the chest. Blood glucose should be assessed always. Um, if the baby is uh, requiring resuscitation, um, babies have zero blood glucose stores when they're born. So if they're metabolically stressed, they'll burn through it quickly, but they could also be just hypoglycemic at birth. Um, maybe mom has gestational diabetes and is on anti-diabetic and is taking insulin. And so maybe mom's blood sugar was a little low and baby's blood sugar, therefore, because of concentration gradients is very low. Um, so a little bit of D10 can go a long way uh, for these little babies if they're hypogly uh, hypoglycemic. And then opioid reversal should be considered. Um, a lot of if mom was on uh, was using drugs uh, at near or around the time of delivery or prior to delivery, um, that will circulate to the baby and baby may be depressed um, because of maternal drug use. Um, and so Narcan can be given as well and they can be given intranasally or vascular, vascularly. All right, when to scale back interventions, right? So we've been doing this, we bagged the baby, we rechecked them, not doing well, we bagged them better. We started our, um, uh, we started compressions. We got access. We gave a, gave a dose of epi. When do we start scaling stuff back? So every minute as we're doing this, we're going to recheck the baby. Once our heart rate is greater than 60, we can stop compressions. When the heart rate gets greater than 100, we can stop positive pressure ventilation. <coughs> At that point, it is good monitoring of the baby, cardiac monitor, pulse ox, um, monitoring their heart rate. If their heart rate starts to drop, then we're gonna have to restart some of these interventions. Assuming the baby, after we scale these things back and does well, then we move on to sort of the post-resuscitation care and it's blow by oxygen and just warming of the baby, keep the baby warm. Again, I can't stress how important it is to keep the baby warm. Um, babies don't do well getting cold. As baby's temperature drops, baby will start to depress. Heart rate will start to go down. Breathing will start to go down. Babies can go into an arrest state just from getting a little cold. Um, so it really is important part of the resuscitation and especially a post-resuscitation care to keep the baby warm. Where to transport? This decision will have a lot of factors associated with it. The extent of resuscitation and the availability of your equipment. Ideally though, you wanna to go to a center that has NICU capabilities, right? We don't necessarily wanna take this baby that we've resuscitated or are resuscitating to a place that probably can't give them necessarily any better care than what we can. Um, so those are the places that have NICUs in our area. Um, St. V's Maine, Grandview, Princeton, UAB Win and Infants in Brookwood all have NICUs and have neonatology in-house. Um, so I would suggest that depending on where you are, there's not too many places in the Birmingham, greater Birmingham metro area that are very, very far from one of those centers. Um, if it's an extra five minutes, that's probably an extra five minutes well spent getting them somewhere that can care, that has the capabilities um, to care for them. 
for a lot of us, that's mostly going to be U, uh, UAB women and infants and going downtown. Please do not bring the neonate to children's. We can take care of them, but the reality is we don't like to take care of them. <laughs> the RN, the RNICU is actually in the Women and Infants Center at UAB, and there's two NICUs. There's one at Children's, which is essentially the surgical and cardiovascular NICU, and there's one in UAB, which is the RNICU, which is essentially like the medical NICU, if you will. Um, and so, and we don't really want to separate baby from mom too much. So what you do is when you call, you guys are used to calling the MEU at women and infants to tell them you're bringing in a patient, like a pregnant woman, call them and tell them that you've delivered a baby and they're resuscitating the baby. And what that does is you guys go straight back to the elevators where you're used to going up to the MEU. There's actually a room there off to the left that is a essentially like maternal baby emergency room. Um, and so there's a room for delivery that's set up for delivery and emergency section. And then there's a room to the side of that that has a baby warmer and essentially all the neonatal resuscitation supplies. Um, and that's where you'll take <clears throat> where you'll take the baby um, and the NICU team will come down and meet you there. You just have to tell them that you need them ready. All right, so this is a card that uh, an ER doc put together. It's called NRP for the non-neonatologist. Um, and basically, it takes the neo, the NRP card and makes a lot of good notes. And it has a lot of the information that I talked about today. Um, so it has the uh, where the SAT goes on the right hand, where the ECG leads go, how to compress the baby. It's got notes about how long you do each time, each thing. Um, it has the one to three uh, ratio on there. Um, and so you can actually download this from the internet and keep it around. Stick it in your OB kit. It's a good place to keep it because if you ever need this, that's probably one of the things you're going to have out. Um, and it's a nice little uh, reminder of NRP for folks who don't do this regularly. All right, so transportation of kids. We'll talk about this real quick because that was actually supposed to be the topic today, um, but that literally takes like five minutes to talk about. And since Julie was talking about uh, birth, it seemed like a good time to talk about neonatal resuscitation too. <clears throat> so transportation of kids. Uh, first off, before we transition to that, does anybody have any questions about neonatal stuff? Was there anything online, Wes? There's just a comment that said, put the baby in a Ziploc bag. Slide the baby in feet first and zip lock around his shoulders. Yeah. Don't go put the head in. You need access to that to ventilate them. But yeah, put them in, kind of zip lock around their shoulders. And the polyethylene in the Ziploc baggie actually basically cuts off all the evaporative heat loss. Because remember, these little babies, we're talking about, this is neonates. We're, we're talking about preemie neonates at that. These are the 25, 26 weekers. Their skin is basically jello. Um, and they have no ability to retain heat. Um, so by as you're actively rewarming them, they're essentially losing all of that again to evaporate of heat loss. So by putting them in there, you're actually improving your warming because they're actually retaining that heat at that point. Got it. That's just a, I think it's just a new concept. That's yeah. Popular. It has happened since I taught this class and it went well. I taught this for you guys at Centerpoint like a couple months ago and it has happened since then and it went well. Yeah, yeah. So, and yeah, and there's the the bag, the um, there's a clear bag in the OB kit that is um, for trash, essentially, but that trash bag is polyethylene, and so it works just as well. Uh, all right, so transport of peds. This is quick and simple, so we'll be done a little early, but uh, establish, so basically, uh, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration in 2012 um, said, hey, um, it turns out that whenever there's an ambulance accident involving kids, kids tend to die. It doesn't go very well. Um, and so in 2012, they said, hey, we need some guidelines for this because we have to improve safety. Um, and basically, uh, for quite a while after that, everybody said, yeah, we need that. And nobody did anything. Uh, mainly because there's a lot of unanswered questions um, about uh, lack of ambulance crash testing research specific to kids, right? So 
Ambulances get crash tested by their manufacturer all the time, but how are they tested? They're tested with adult mannequins strapped to a cot that's secured in the back, right? Most of them are not crash tested with a little human or a baby. And so uh, a few years later, NACIMSO, which is the National Association of State EMS Officials, they said, hey, you know what? This is bad. We still don't have these about, I don't know, eight years later. And so we're going to take on this task. Um, and they created a task force uh, to advocate for creation of evidence-based standards for pediatric transport. That being said, they recognize the fact that it's going to take years of research uh, in order to uh, figure out how to actually crash test ambulance for kids and safe ways to secure them. And so uh, they did create an expert panel, basically created some interim guidance in order to try and reduce confusion and reduce injuries to kids in ambulance crashes. Um, so NACIMSO recommended the following immediate actions to improve safety in ambulances. Um, EMS agencies should develop policies and procedures um, that address the following elements. Methods, training, equipment to secure children during transport to reduce forward motion and possible ejection. Um, considerations for the very conditions of patients which may be encountered by EMS. Prohibits children from being transported without a restraint. So traditionally in EMS, when we've transported a kid, especially a smaller kid, how have we always done it? We've strapped mom to the cot and had mom hold the kid, right? I mean, that's how I did it when I was a medic for years. That's traditionally how we've done it. It turns out if you wreck or roll an ambulance, that's not super safe, um, which I think is kind of intuitive, but not anything we all really think about. Uh, and then provision for securing equipment during transport with mounting systems, which has become a new standard anyway. Um, and then only use child restraint devices um, for the position which they are designed and tested. Um, and so basically the idea is um, don't let them be held by mom. And really we should have some kind of equipment that really is designed to kids to secure them. Now, the best that can be their car seat, right? A car seat in the airway seat is a very secure way to transport a kid, right? There's seat belts in the airway seat. A car seat is designed for a crash and to protect the baby. So if we can utilize a car seat, a car seat in the airway seat is really ideal. That being said, not all of our patients always are going to fold up into their car seat. Sometimes we need them out to work on them. Sometimes they, they're just a bigger kid, right? Um, and so <coughs> the EMS agency should have appropriately sized child restraint systems available on ambulance to transport kids. They need, people need trained on them. They should cover a wide range of weights um, and the manufacturer's recommendations should be followed. Um, so Nesimso doesn't really recommend any specific products. Um, Ferno is the one that sort of took the lead on this. Um, there's a couple companies since then in the last couple of years that now have um, systems out there, but Ferno was really the first one. They were the ones that said, you know what, we're gonna, we're going to pick up the ball here. And so they developed what they call the Neomate and Pedimate uh, transport systems. And basically, this, these are essentially like devices that secure to the cot that then secure the kid to them. And the Neomate goes down to, I think, like two, one to two kilos up to about five. And then the Pedimate is five kilos or 10 kilos and up. Um, and they actually went out and got some ambulances and put their cot systems in them and various cot systems. And they t actually crash tested these and showed that these actually do a really good job of keeping the kids secure and preventing them from being ejected and rolling around the cabin and all the good stuff. Um, so they were the ones who sort of took the lead on this. Um, they're relatively inexpensive and a lot of agencies have them because, um, what was it, five years ago? I feel like my concept of linear time got destroyed with COVID. Um, I always say something was a year ago and then I realized it was pre-COVID and that's like three years now, but uh, it was probably about five or six years ago, EMSC through the state, um, we did this as an equipment grant for agencies and gave out something over two years, like uh, 200 or something ridiculous number of these. Um, so a lot of agencies have these. Um, the trick is to train on them. They are pretty easy to use and to put on, um, but it's not necessarily super intuitive. Um, it definitely requires initial training and ongoing training to remember how to secure them to the cot correctly. Um, so the really important thing is if you have one, make sure you are training on it and know how to use it. Um, because especially if you're in a hurry, 
um, on scene, trying to get off scene. Again, they're not super hard to secure, but it does take a little bit of practice. And if you're not practiced up on it, um, then it's not a good time to try and figure it out on scene um, because invariably that's going to lead to problems. All right, guys, that is it for me. Uh, Short into the point. Real quick, a couple of slides ago, you had the uh, um, <laughs> cheat card. It had a page on it that was printed really small. People were asking for the web page. Oh, yeah, it's way down there. Way Just down. Google NRP for the neonatologist and go to the image search and it'll pop up. So let's talk a little bit about the transport piece. On the transport piece, on the device you're talking about, is it secure the baby and the mother together or just the baby? Just right? the baby. So does that mean then if we have an in the field birth, we have to have two cops transport both patients, in other words, two units? In theory, yes. Again, this is this is one of the why does Simso sort of recommended these interim expert panel guidelines um, because there's still a lot of unanswered questions, right? Like if baby's doing well, we know one of the best ways to keep baby warm is actually giving it to mom. And so how do we address that? And that is one of the things that is sort of one of the big unanswered questions. And we obviously, you know, if we're having to actively resuscitate the baby, getting access, intubating it, we're probably going to have a second, want a second unit there anyway. And that's sort of a different story. But otherwise, if the baby just requires a little resuscitation and does well, we don't necessarily want to separate that baby from mom, right? Um, and so as much as I hate to say it, that's probably a baby in arms situation, despite the fact that's not necessarily safe. Um, because again, we don't, there is no answer to what's the best way to do that yet. And that's one of the things that the SIMSO and the panel is doing research on to try and work out through EMSC. So the other <laughs> issue that's come up here several times, actually, we've spoken about it in the past, is there's a hesitation to separate mom and baby when one or the other is critical, but, but you kind of have to because you can't yeah. work in a critical patient with another patient in the back. Yeah. You, you agree with that? Yes. So, that's a two crew job. If you're having to actively resuscitate baby, somebody's got to take care of mom and vice versa. And they may need to go to two different destinations. Yes. Which is also a point of contention. Yeah. I mean, most of, if you're going to one of the places on here, all those places have OB and have. NICU and so you may be you probably you may be able to get them to the same place if you're going to one of these but there may be some situations where mom needs more emergent care and going to the closest ER that can take care of her may not have NICU capabilities and that's not necessarily unreasonable so you may end up going to just because we're out in center point you may end up going to St. V's East with mom and downtown to UAB with the baby yeah, yeah, fair. <laughs> um, so we've got a little bit of chatter going on about um, <laughs> the umbilical line. So first of all, currently that's not in our scope of practice. Correct. To do an umbilical line. Secondly, the chatter is how does the clamping work if you're going to do an umbilical line? Do you run the chances of having an umbilical line if you put a clamp? No. So you clamp the cord from the baby. Usually you go like an inch above the the stump, essentially, right? And so when you clamp it, you go above the like an inch above. And then what you'll do to start an umbilical line is you just take a scalpel and you just slice through the cord below where the clamp is. They're not very fun to put in. Gotcha. I mean, umbilical venous lines aren't bad. Umbilical arterial lines are actually incredibly hard to put in because the artery spirals inside and it's uh, they're very tiny and they vasospasm as soon as you cut the cord. So umbilical arterial lines are actually incredibly hard, but umbilical venous lines are pretty simple. Again, you just kind of feed it until you get blood back. Your goal is to not make this central. If you're trying to make it a central line that you're going to use for like the baby in the NICU, it's a little more challenging, but an emergent line is called a low line line. You just put it in until you get blood, and that's pretty easy. So they just texted me and said they couldn't hear me. That's why I'm up here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I just thought maybe you wanted to give me a hug or something. So I started well, moving this way. Well, we have a lot of participation online today, which I think uh, is a testament to how much 
uh, EMS providers in Alabama really crave good pediatric education. So really appreciate you being here, as well as Dr. Brown's lecture that both spoke to those issues. So we heard some really innovative things from you today, like warming a, a premature baby in a plastic bag, uh, pulse ox on the right hand only because of fetal circulation. Uh, oh, and the best way to take a pulse, I don't think I covered this, taking a pulse in a little tiny baby is actually a little hard, guys. Um, you can do femoral is probably going to be one bet. And then the easiest way to do it is actually put your fingers around the, the very base of the umbilical stump. And you can actually feel baby's pulse through the umbilical stump and count it off that way. Those are the two easiest ways. Um, NRP, for years, we've always done with the umbilical stump. All of a sudden, a couple years ago, they decided that what well, maybe wasn't the best. And the reason was because you kind of have to pinch the stump a little bit and they're worried about people feeling their own pulse, a little, which you shouldn't be pinching it that hard, honestly. But right. um, you really can be very soft and just kind of put your fingers around it. Um, but the way they recommend now is actually using a stethoscope, putting over the baby's heart and actually taking your finger and kind of tapping on the table and tapping out the rhythm because that lets you count it, but it also gives everybody around you a verbal clue of, is it too slow? Is it fast? Are we bad? Are we good? Um, and that, so that people can start gearing up for the resuscitation. Um, but checking it at the stump of the umbilicus or at the umbilical stump is actually the way most people tend to still do it. It's the way we've done it for a long time. Yeah, those are both great suggestions. And that's something that EMS providers don't hear in their, uh, or have not traditionally heard in their essential education. So that's something new to the table. Another tool in our toolbox. We appreciate that. Uh, we've got some some things coming up. Dr. Brown mentioned uh, Alabama EMS treatment protocols going to affect April 29th. Um, so agencies make sure that you're making arrangements to update your required equipment and drug formularies uh, and and continuous training training, training, involving your medical director is my suggestion um, to make sure that we get it right. A lot more responsibility on the EMS providers with this new protocol update. So uh, let's live up to the to the awesome responsibilities that we've been given and, uh, and improve our, our patient care, I think is the key there. Also, a couple of quick announcements. If you didn't get the um, link off of the chat box for the attendance form you can send an email to alabama ems challenge at gmail.com you'll get an automated response with a link to the attendance form the password for today's attendance form is peds p e d s, P -E -D -S all lowercase uh, a week from today we'll be in decatur hosted by decatur fire department we'll have a two-hour lecture followed by a, a skills lab we're doing it a week early because uh, Dr. Ferguson and I are both speaking separately at Jimscom, uh, which is co-hosted with FDIC in Indianapolis, and we'll be there the last week of this month. Coming up in May, I believe it's May 25th, uh, EMS Challenge at the end of the month will be at Opelika, hosted by Opelika Fire Department with another skills lab on the second Wednesday in May. We'll be back here at Centerpoint Fire. So you can contact me at wward at centerpointfire.com with any questions for the certificate, which gets an automated response. Please email um, Alabama EMS Challenge at gmail.com. And anybody else have any other announcements, comments, questions? Well, thank you everybody for participating today, and we're going to wrap it up. We'll see you next time.